27, Section 2. The title of it is Imperialism, and today we're going to be using the uh, nation of Nigeria as a case study. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, this new phase of empire building uh, that affected Africa, but also affected the rest of the world. And we're going to zoom in by looking at what happened with Nigeria. So first off, um, back to Britain. Britain's urban populations were growing rapidly. And one of the main reasons for this was industrialization. People were flocking to cities and people were taking jobs in these factories that even though conditions were very miserable relative to our time, they were still better than what people had on the farms. And so people were flocking to the cities and people were making more money. And the fact that more workers were making more money spurred a demand for more expensive stuff. And so as a result, uh, with this increased demand for more expensive stuff, uh, there's an increased demand to uh, source products and materials from all over the world. And so different European nations got involved in the, the game of imperialism um, to, number one, influence the political and social lives of these people. Uh, so, for example, when Great Britain conquered India and held them as a colony, they used the people of India as a controlled market. By law, the people of India had to buy British-made goods. They could also shape economics and shape... Uh, this, this affected the economics of Europe in a big way because the triangle trade system was so profitable um, that it affected the way that Europeans interacted with the West African countries. It affected the way that Europeans interacted uh, with... Uh, the, the kind of the coastal colonies of the New World. And then finally, European people wanted to spread their culture. You know, they wanted uh, the peoples of Africa to begin wearing suits, to begin speaking their language, to begin practicing their religion, uh, to begin acting in their And so this is all control. And, and these European colonies had four basic forms of control over their territory. Now, one is, is the most strict, just a strict colony. That is like the colony of New Jersey. It was a royal colony directly controlled by the British crown. But there are other forms of control. For example, a protectorate. Like Cuba in 1898 became a protectorate of the United States meaning that Cuba had a degree of independence, but they also had to agree to accept no money from any other country. We retained the right to put a military base in Cuba, and they could make no formal alliances with any other country. And we retained the right to intervene in their affairs whenever we saw fit. That's a protectorate. Next, there's spheres of influence. Uh, this is really kind of the story of China. So, for example, um, in Beijing, in China, Great Britain was heavily involved in the opium trade. So they were sourcing opium from places like Afghanistan. They were taking the opium and selling it to markets in China. Well, and then, once upon a time, the princess of China said, we've really got to stop the opium trade. Britain is getting our people hooked on narcotics and so she said we're not going to buy your opium anymore so britain sent their army to take over the city of beijing to keep their drug trade open and that's a sphere of influence that the outside power controls investment and trading but politically gives at least the appearance of autonomy and then finally, economic imperialism. And this is really where we are today, is that private business interests assert control. And this is also going on throughout the 1700s, 1800s as well, like the East India Trading Company, if you've ever read about them. And so next, you've got to think about Okay, so Great Britain conquered India. How does that work? 
Well, they went in with their army. They had bigger guns. They uh, had the superior technology. They also had the fact that European diseases tended to wipe out indigenous groups. They had all that going for them. Okay, so now they've conquered this place. Well, how are they going to rule it? Well, they got two basic philosophies to work off of. One is direct control and one is indirect control. Let's start with indirect because that's generally where Great Britain would try to begin. Indirect control is kind of like the Mongols. They would go in, they would put up a British flag, they would require that the people pay taxes, and that was it. Otherwise, the local peoples got to govern, and occasionally uh, the British would come in and tell those local governors what to do. And then the local governors would rule in their name. But otherwise, they live their lives. They pay their taxes, they follow their laws, but it's all through their local government. That's indirect control. Limited self-rule for local governments. Direct control. This would often be the result of a rebellion. So, for example, when India rebelled first against the British in the Sepoy Mutiny, the British re responded by sending in lots of troops. More direct control. Um, you know, where they began to take over a greater role into the lives of the people of India. That would be paternalism. And then finally, if you go to India, many people there speak English. Many folks there were educated in British universities because the British not only wanted to have a relationship with India for their economic benefit, they also wanted to spread their culture. So for example, if you go to South Africa, there's white people, descendants of British colonizers, and there are black people who were the indigenous folks when the British conquered South Africa and held it as a colony for many, many years. And so now I want to look at Nigeria. Nigeria was conquered by the British through clever diplomacy, but also through force. And by 1914, Britain claimed all of Nigeria as a colony. But now it's a culturally diverse area. There are 250 different ethnic groups in Nigeria alone. And like I said, their first tactic is to use indirect control to rule through the local rulers. And indirect rule actually worked very successfully in Nigeria through Hausa Fulani. But again, 250 different ethnic groups in this one nation alone. And so the Yoruba and the Igbo peoples who were living there uh, resented British control. Now, imperialism, that is again a stronger country maintaining control over a weaker one, often was met with resistance. But Europeans tended to have the superior weapons and technology and were able to impose their will. But there were many cases where these people would try to resist European rule. For example, in Algeria, uh, the country of Algeria fought against French imperialism for 50 years. The French in West Africa were fought against for 16 years. Now, again, in case after case after case, colonial peoples rose up against their imperial powers. Some were successful, some were not, but it often led to great violence. Now in Ethiopia, the emperor there, Menelik II, managed to resist the Europeans. In fact, Ethiopia is one of the only countries in Africa that successfully resisted European imperialism throughout their entire history. 
And they did so in a number of clever ways. For example, they played Europeans against each other. They would seek help from one group that was a rival of a different group. They also maintained a large stockpile of modern weapons. And so on multiple occasions, the most recent being in the Second World War, Ethiopia managed to defeat Italy and maintain their independence. Now, when we think about the legacy of colonial rule, we'll start with the negative. These African countries, with the exception of Ethiopia, lost their land, lost their independence, and lost many lives by the hundreds of thousands. It's led to a breakdown in traditional culture. And these divisions, these artificial divisions that were created by European spheres of influence, led to divisions in Africa as a whole. And many of these problems created by this continue until today. Benefits, however, colonialism did manage to reduce local fighting. They did build railroads. They did build schools. They did improve sanitation. And in many cases, these European powers did bring in modern technologies, which fostered economic growth.